Well, good evening. We're pleased that you're joining us virtually uh, here at the Tenement Museum for our book talk on City of Dreams, the 400 year epic history of immigrant New York. I'm Elizabeth Vendito for the Tenement Museum. Um, I'm joined by the author, Tyler Anbinder, this evening. Um, he is an emeritus professor of history at the George Washington University. He's a specialist in 19th century American politics and the history of immigration and ethnicity in American life. This book, City of Dreams, was published um, in 2016. It's a history of immigrant life in the city from the early 1600s to the present. Um, it's one of our most popular books at the museum, so we're looking forward to a robust discussion tonight. Before we begin, um, we do welcome your questions. We'll have plenty of time for them toward the end of the talk. You're able to um, add your questions to the chat at any time. Um, so feel free ever as the mood strikes you, as you have questions to add them in as well. If you're not familiar with the Tenement Museum, we are located on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. We're a history museum. We tell the stories of immigrants, migrants, and refugees in the United States. So I think we'll just get start, started. Thank you, Tyler, for joining us this evening. Um, can we start with an overview of the book and your writing process? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, the, the overview of the book is basically that what I wanted to do was tell the history of immigrants in New York City. Uh, and and to, in particular to show that immigrants, uh, the, that the life of immigrants in New York really hasn't changed that much over the city's 300, almost 400 year history, coming up on 400 years now. Um, and, and that the, the life of an immigrant from the process of arrival to assimilation or the lack thereof, to adjustment to life, to the kind of jobs they had, um, hasn't really changed over the centuries, even though some of the, that might be hard to believe that, that really the immigrant experience has been the same for the most part throughout that period. And, and that's the theme that, that kind of undergirds the entire book. In terms of the, the research and writing process, it was a different process than, than I used in my previous books, which had looked at one immigrant neighborhood in New York, five points. And then the book before that was a history of the anti-immigrant know-nothing party in the United States. Um, those books covered a rel either a relatively short period of time or a small geographic location. So it was pretty easy to come up with a narrative arc to those stories. It was much harder to figure out a narrative arc to a 400 year story where people come and go so often in it. Um, but eventually, and so that required coming up with kind of a different research and writing process. So, so looking for commonalities between the different groups between the centuries. And what I ended up deciding to do was, uh, because I didn't want the book to read like an encyclopedia, what I ended up doing was um, choosing certain immigrant groups to stand in for the entire immigrant experience for each generation that I look at in the book. So for the 1600s, that was the Dutch. And for the 1700s, that was the Scots and the English. And then for the 1800s, it was the Irish and the Germans. And then for the late 19th and early 20th century, the focus is Italians and Eastern European Jews and so on and so forth till we get to the present. And the book comes all the way up to, you know, it was published in 2016. And so it went right up to the election of 2016. And, and so the writing process therefore was to kind of link those stories across the centuries in a way where the reader felt like they were part of a continuing story and they could see how the story was progressing from one group to the other. Uh, and kind of make the comparisons and see the contrasts that uh, I, that I hope they would see. Oh, by the way, it'd be useful to put up the uh, bird's eye view that I that I gave you guys. It gives a really good sense of the the project in a way. So I love this image. It's a bird's eye view done around 1860 of. New York City, which in that point is just Manhattan there in the middle. There are a couple of nice things about it. One thing is it shows how the city really spilled over to New Jersey there on the right. So on the right there, that's Hoboken and Jersey City. And then in the center uh, above Manhattan to the east is 
Brooklyn, obviously. And one of the great things, if you look at the very bottom of the image there, this is one of the first known images of baseball being played in the United States. And that's at Elysian Fields in Hoboken, where New Yorkers would go and play. Um, but they'd play baseball there. Irish immig immigrants would go and have hurling tournaments there. So uh, those fields were used by all sorts of native born and immigrant New Yorkers a lot alike. But one of the things I try to do in the, in the book is to show how you know, immigrants would start typically at the bottom of Manhattan and kind of work their way northward through the city to nicer neighborhoods and then out into New Jersey or Long Island as they became more assimilated and, and could afford better places to live and they'd be replaced by newer immigrant groups you know, in, in locations like the Lower East Side. So one thing I wanted to ask that comes clear through the book is individual neighborhoods loom very large. You have a number of chapters dedicated to specific uh, neighborhoods. Um, can you talk to us about why certain neighborhoods loom so large in this history, as well as in popular imagination, and why you decided to talk about certain neighborhoods like the Lower East Side so much in the book? Sure. Well, one, one interesting thing that's worth noting is that for most of New York's history, New Yorkers didn't think of themselves as living in neighborhoods per se, or, or at least not named neighborhoods. So they had neighborhoods that they thought of, but they had no names. So, you know, you look at a map of New York City today and the city has created, has named neighborhoods for New Yorkers, which is kind of a very artificial uh, process. But up until the 20th century, New Yorkers tended to think of themselves as residents of wards. And these wards, there were 22 wards in Manhattan. And each ward would be made up of several neighborhoods, but the neighborhoods tended not to have names so much. Um, and, but if you put up the next image, Elizabeth, you know, some neighborhoods became so famous, or in this case, infamous, that their names became well known. So the next image is of the Five Points neighborhood. I skipped ahead. There we go. <laughs> so this is a painting from around 1830 of the Five Points neighborhood. This is just northeast of where City Hall is today. It's This is where kind of Chinatown meets the courthouses in lower Manhattan today. Five Points by the late 1820s had become so infamous that it was a neighborhood whose name people knew. And that was the exception rather than the rule. And as you can see in the image, one of the reasons it was so uh, notorious was because it was a mixed race neighborhood in a period where that was very rare. So you can see here blacks and whites, uh, some of them are fighting, some of them are, uh, are, who knows what they're doing. They are fighting, they are throwing out garbage, they are buying and selling stuff from each other. Uh, and so Five Points becomes famous for that. Most neighborhoods people lived in, though, weren't as famous as Five Points. Um, the one, and so, for example, the Lower East Side, where the Tenement Museum is, uh, you know, that that's kind of too big to be called a single neighborhood for for most people. And so, it had various parts in the in the mid nineteenth century. It was known as Little Germany or Klein Deutschland. Um, Eventually, other neighborhoods become well known enough that New Yorkers know them, like Hell's Kitchen on and what's now the Midtown West Side, uh, places like that. But neighborhoods were very important in terms of how immigrants imagined their lives, um, because immigrants, you know, did most of what they did in their neighborhoods. They tended to work in the same neighborhood they lived in. Right before there is a mass transit system, you need to live near where you work in most cases. And so that's what happens. Then when you get to the late 19th and early 20th century, if you go to that next image, Elizabeth, sure. um, people will think of their neighborhoods. Um, and here's the Lower East Side. This is Hester Street, a little south of the Tenement Museum, but still part of the Lower East Side. And you know, one thing that happens by, the, by 1900 is Manhattan is just so much more crowded that you have scenes like this. Five Points had been the most crowded residential neighborhood in the world around the time of the American Civil War, but the Lower East Side is much more crowded than, than Five Points 50 years later. And Manhattan just isn't big enough to fit all the immigrants anymore. And so it's 
it's not a coincidence at all that, that New York City expands and becomes the five boroughs right around 1900 because the immigrants were spreading out from Manhattan into the Bronx, into Brooklyn, into Queens too, and even into Staten Island. And so, so neighborhoods become this very important way in which uh, immigrants learn how to be Americans and eventually uh, assimilate. And so I wanted to ask you about some of the neighborhoods that you talk about in the book. So you talk about the Lower East Side, you talk about Little Italy, um, you talk about Klein Deutschland. So why are these neighborhoods, if you're gonna tell the history of the entire city, why are these neighborhoods uh, worth just a deeper dive for you? Well, they kind of encapsulate the story of the immigrant experience. So with the Lower East Side, for example, you know, to talk about uh, Eastern European Jews, for example, um, pretty much all of them will start on the Lower East Side and they'll get jobs, for example, in uh, garment workshops, uh, in sweatshops, and that's the place that immigrants will, will start. And so it's this common experience that they all have. You look at New York's Little Italy's, and one of the most important things to keep in mind is that New York had far too many Italian immigrants to have just one little Italy. So New York had many little Italy's a hundred years ago. There was the one that is officially on the city maps now, just above Canal Street around Mulberry. But then, you know, basically the whole area from Canal Street up to NYU was one huge series of Italian neighborhoods. So really several little Italy's. Then East Harlem was another little Italy. And there were areas of the Bronx that were also heavily Italian and were also Little Italy's. But an Italian immigrant, just like the Jewish immigrants on the Lower East Side, an Italian immigrant, the first thing they would do when they got to New York typically was go to Mulberry Street, find someone from the part of Italy they came from, and from there find a job, find a place to live, uh, and kind of get started. The immigrants who had already arrived would help the new immigrant buy clothes, exchange money if they had any, write a letter home, letting their loved ones know that they had arrived safely. So these were really kind of staging grounds for the immigrants uh, in their efforts to uh, become Americans. Though, of course, it's important to realize that a lot of the immigrants initially had no intention of becoming Americans. And this, this is something that, that we tend not to think about very much, especially because we tend to look at immigrant history through our, our immigrant ancestors, who, of course, became American or we wouldn't be here. But for example, lots of Italian immigrants come to America with no intention of staying. They come to New York to uh, get a job, earn much more money than they could in Italy, and then bring that cash back with them to Europe to uh, pay debts, to buy a farm, to start a business, uh, to pay the dowry for a, a sister, any of these things. And so a lot of those uh, Italian immigrants aren't planning to, to assimilate, have no interest in assimilating because they don't plan to stay. And only later, you know, say when World War I starts and it becomes much more difficult to leave, or they get here and they discover and they decide they like America much more than they had expected, then, then they might stay and then they might uh, start that assimilation process. And so um, when we're talking about Italians in this conversation, in the book, you're talking mostly about Italian communities and the late 19th and early 20th century, but this theme of, of people coming to a place, what we would call chain migration, people coming to a place, talking to people of a, of a similar background, finding jobs and housing. This seems to be one of the threads that you've woven through the book that focus on the community ties and community networks. Definitely, I, I wanted to make it clear uh, in, in the political discussion of the last decade or so, chain migration has come up a lot and it's been, used kind of as a pejorative term, uh, as if it's a new thing and a bad thing that immigrants come to the United States and then use the money they earn here to bring others uh, from their families with them. And I wanted to make the point that that's been the case throughout American history from, from the Dutch all the way to the present, that immigrants have always come to the United States, uh, saved money to bring other family members, most because the immigrants more often than not couldn't afford to come with their whole families. And so very often, you know, with, with the work I'm doing now with the uh, famine, Great Famine and the Irish, you know, very rarely could those families afford to, to emigrate 
uh, together. So they choose the family member who seemed like they had the best prospect of earning money uh, and send them to America. And their job was to scrimp and save every penny possible so they could bring the next sibling over. And then once there were two of them there uh, in New York, they would scrimp and save to as quickly as possible, bring a third sibling. And then if, once they ran out of siblings, bring parents. Uh, or cousins and, and so forth until everyone who wanted to come to America could do so. And so one of the things you find is, is we tend to think of, you know, we have the Great Famine, which starts in the late 1840s, and we tend to think it lasts a couple of years, and that's the, the end of Irish immigration. But for years and years, and even decades after, those famine Irish immigrants are bringing relatives over to America when they become old enough uh, to want to do so, or circumstances uh, change and, and they want to do so. And so and so that's one of the reasons that I focus on chain migration in the book is because I wanted to make it clear that this is not a new thing that only today's immigrants are doing, but it's something that, that immigrants have always done. And in the book too, it becomes a really important part of how people move within the city. So you talk a lot about people making their first home in the city in Manhattan, but then later moving to outer boroughs, moving to neighborhoods they consider better moving to places where they can live in a better apartment or buy a house and doing that through extended family members through community networks. Right, this is another common theme that you find with all the immigrant groups who've come to New York is that, that they tend to start in these immigrant enclaves where people tend to speak their language or and even if they're English or Irish and they already speak English, um, still immigrants are, are tending to live in these, these enclaves where the new immigrants tend to settle. And that tends to be lower Manhattan. And not a coincidence, that's where their boats would, where the ships would, would leave them. It's, it's only, you know, we tend to think of Ellis Island as, as having always existed, but that only uh, it opens in 1892. And up until that point, you know, your ship would, could dock anywhere in the Hudson River, even in the East River and you'd get off the ship there. And so immigrants tended to settle very close to where those ships dropped them off, in part because one of the most popular jobs for immigrant men was to then unload the ships that came in after the one that dropped them off. But immigrants understood that those neighborhoods tended to have uh, poor housing, that the death rate in those neighborhoods was much worse than in the rest of the city. And so once they could afford to do so, most immigrants would move to other neighborhoods. And so if you take Eastern European Jews on the Lower East Side where the Tenement Museum is, they would move further north in Manhattan or to Brooklyn, which was a very popular location. Uh, Brooklyn was especially popular because Brooklyn had tenements too, but the tenements were bigger, they were airier, they were lighter, there was more room for their kids to play. And so so you might move from one tenement to another, but the tenements outside the, the Lower East Side were much uh, nicer and, uh, and just healthier than the ones that the tenement, like the one the Tenement Museum occupies. And for- So I have to stop you there though, because sure. um, we are the Tenement Museum and not everybody knows what is the tenement and why is it so important? Why does it loom so large in the city's history? Sure, why don't you put up the next image and we can, we can sure. talk about that. It's my favorite question to ask when we do tours of the museum. What is a tenement? Okay. So a tenement, there we go. There are some iconic tenements. That's Mulberry Street, just south of Canal, looking north towards Canal. So a tenement is a building in which multiple non-related families live together. And so a tenement can be as small as uh, you know, a single family house or as big as these brick buildings you can see in front of you. This is, this is Mulberry Street right around 1900. And so the first tenements in New York actually don't look like these. The first tenements in New York are wooden houses that had been built for single families that the families had left and the owners had subdivided into, uh, into apartments. And eventually, and this is especially during the great famine of the late 1840s, New York City uh, landowners 
with so many immigrants coming to New York, decide, well, why should we have these little two-story wooden houses when I can tear that down and build a five or six-story brick building like the ones you see in this picture, and I can squeeze a lot more immigrants and therefore a lot more rent out of my 25-foot by 100-foot lot in Manhattan. So these brick tenements are built, like the one at the, at the Tenement Museum. And I mean, tenements are such an important part of the immigrant experience in, and it's important to realize in New York, because, you know, if you look at immigrant life in the United States as a whole, this kind of building, New York immigrants lived in them, Chicago immigrants lived in them, some neighborhoods of Boston, but in most of the United States, you don't have tenements like these. You know, you look at Philadelphia, for instance, one of the biggest cities in the United States for most of American history. And immigrants lived in what they call their row houses. And that would have been the same in Baltimore and in Washington and most of the country. And so the tenement, it's not a uniquely New York thing, but it's a particularly New York thing. And of course, there are tenements outside the United States too. Glasgow, Scotland has a tenement museum, which I highly recommend for, for the people watching when you make it there. But it's totally different. You go to the tenement museum in Glasgow and you're like, wait a second. This, these people look like they're well-to-do. They have all this fine stuff. And you, and you learn that a tenement in the Scottish context is, is very different. But in terms of New York, um, tenements tend to be where people lived because um, they were cheap and you were with lots of people from the same place you came from. Um, and they were convenient to the kinds of jobs that immigrants tended to have. And so tenements, become associated with immigrants and not necessarily in a good way. So, you know, native born New Yorkers look down upon immigrants in part because they live in tenements. Um, and native born New Yorkers wonder why don't these immigrants move to better places? Why don't they demand better housing? And of course that has to do in part with the chain migration you asked about Elizabeth because they're trying to scrimp and save every penny to bring more family members over, or to start a business, uh, or to save enough money to have an emergency fund should somebody in the family get sick or die. And so, so there, the immigrants, you know, priorities are very different than those of the native born. Did that answer uh, that question? Yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> so many questions about tenements, but yeah, we're a little, we're a little bit fond of, of tenement history here. Um, can you talk a little bit about how tenements in some of these neighborhoods you mentioned shape people's social and cultural life once they've migrated to New York? Sure. Why don't you put up that next image, Elizabeth, and I can talk about that. Sure. So tenements shape immigrants' social uh, and cultural lives in a number of ways. So here's a, a woman carrying, this is an Italian woman carrying uh, clothes she worked on either to or from the contractor who, who gave her this, this work. And so one important way in which uh, tenements shape immigrants' lives is because a lot of work is done in the tenements. So this woman is taking these, these uh, this clothing back to her apartment where she's going to do the sewing that she's been hired to do. So tenements were, were full of immigrants who did not only lived in them, but worked in them too. Some of Jacob Reese's famous, uh, most famous images are of, of tenement work being done, uh, cigars being rolled, clothing being, being sewn, uh, and so forth. And then uh, Lewis Hine, the photographer of this image, uh, is, is famous for documenting that in particular, especially in his work documenting child labor. And, and, and so, so work is one way in which tenements shape immigrants' lives. And then in terms of, of kind of social life, there, there are several ways in which it did so. So for many, probably most immigrant groups, uh, women socializing outside of their uh, homes was frowned upon. So men would go out of the home to work. They might go to saloons to socialize. Women weren't allowed to go to, to saloons for most of New York's history. And so women would much more often than not be socializing in the tenements, either in each other's apartments or in the backyard, maybe while hanging up clothes to, to dry. Uh, 
or while washing the clothes and, and or while sitting on the stoop and watching the children play. And so the, the tenements were a very important part of that. And so very often you find that immigrants, not just from the same country, say Italy, but from the same parts of those countries would tend to live in the same tenements uh, so they could be near uh, people who had the same customs, celebrated the same feast days uh, and so forth. And I should mention, because you mentioned a saloon, your backdrop, which is from the Schneider Saloon in the basement of the museum's uh, 97 Orchard Street building, which is uh, a German lager beer saloon from 1860s, 1880s. Right, so thanks so much for mentioning that. I totally forgot that that's, <laughs> that's back there. So yeah, this is the saloon that is in the basement of the Tenement Museum. And this would have been pretty much a male only space. If a woman entered this space, it, they would be frowned upon and shooed out. You know, maybe you could come in uh, uh, with the growler to uh, fill it with beer for your husband if your husband say, uh, uh, couldn't come in. But for the most part, a, a saloon was very much a, a male only space. Uh, and that was the case for the Irish, that was the case for Germans, uh, and, and for, for most immigrant groups. And sometimes you'll see images of, of men and women drinking together um, from, uh, you know, from say Jacob Rees. Anytime you see that, you know that was considered very out of line that the people, that if you see men and women drinking together, the, the idea you're supposed to be getting from that image is look how terrible this is. Mm. And I think that leads me to another question that we've been talking about before this um, this evening about the difference between um, people from communities telling their own story and outsiders coming in and telling their stories. And we see that throughout New York City's in history. But you'd mentioned Louis Hahn, you mentioned Jacob Reese, people very famous for documenting some of these neighborhoods we've been discussing. Yes, in, in, in all of my writing, it's always very important as a historian to try to let to try to let your historical actors tell their own stories because they're the ones who best know their motivations and can best describe their lives. Um, that was in, in my my uh, second book, Five Points. That was one of the one of the reasons I think nobody had ever written a history of Five Points was because people thought it couldn't be done because they thought that the people who lived there hadn't left any record. And it turned out they had, it was just, you know, it was not in the places historians usually go look, right? You, to write a, a history of New York City, you typically go to the New York Historical Society or New York Public Library. But those places in, the, in their manuscript divisions tend to save the papers of famous wealthy people. And five pointers had left their story written down. It just was in places you'd expect. So, you know, I would find it in places like um, the police records where there were thousands and thousands of affidavits that five pointers gave uh, testifying uh, typically against their neighbors who they would complain about for one thing or another and, and uh, have them arrested or sue them. And so you could find police records, you could find uh, real estate records, um, bank records, all, all sorts of things in which immigrants can tell their stories. Um, and so it's not easy to track these things down, but I think it's really important because often outsiders don't really understand or they think they understand, uh, but don't uh, understand the, the immigrants' experiences. So I, so I think uh, whenever possible, you really have to let the immigrants speak for themselves. And I wanna ask how you do that because you do that throughout the book. Um, how do you do that in a, a, a book that has such a large scope? Well, so in, in, in a book like City of Dreams, one of the things I have to rely on are other historians who have written, you know, really detailed histories of Italians or Eastern European Jews or the Irish. And they spend years tracking down the stories of these immigrants and finding the diaries and the letters. Letters are another thing that, of course, are great for an immigration historian to have. And again, we tend to think, oh, these immigrants, they're illiterate, they didn't leave letters, but they usually did. Um, they're just harder to find because again, historical societies don't tend to buy them um, or accept them for donations. And so it's really important to, uh, to track them down. And so I can rely on other historians and, uh, to help me find them and to point me to them. And then I use those to help the immigrants uh, tell the stories. And, and that's, that's a, 
you know, the most important way to tell immigration history. And you use your own family story in this book as well to tell that history. I do. Why don't you skip to that image so people can see that? I think I'll just skip ahead a little bit. Oh, no, that is. There they are. So those are the Ann Binders. Uh, who lived in Haleskov, which was a shtetl in Ukraine, kind of south central Ukraine, midway between Kiev and Odessa. And my great grandfather immigrated to New York around 1911 and became a presser in a garment factory and was trying to save up enough money to bring his wife, who's there on the top row in the middle and his five children to New York with him. But he discovered it was a lot harder to save up money for six fares than he realized. And then World War I intervened. So it wasn't until um, more than a decade after he arrived in New York that he was able to get the rest of the family to America. The one boy there in the family on the bottom left, that's Tulia, my grandfather, and I'm, my name Tyler, I'm named after him. And so, so one thing I do in, in, the, in the book is I interweave the story of all my immigrant ancestors in there. So when I talk about the Eastern European Jews, I talk about the Anbinders. When I talk about uh, German immigration, I talk about the immigrants on my mother's side of the family. Um, and, and I weave them in to try to add a personal side to the story. And, when, uh, and I have to admit, uh, this was not an original idea with me, one of my favorite uh, one of the kind of first seminal works on American immigration history is a, a book by Ron Takaki called Strangers from a Different Shore, which is a history of Asian Americans. And he does that in the book. He has, uh, he has Japanese uh, ancestors, Chinese ancestors, Filipino ancestors, and in each chapter he weaves them into the story. And I thought that was a lovely touch. And so I do that in the, in the book. And one of the, my favorite things is, you know, I get a lot of emails from readers and Nine times out of ten, they will mention that as their favorite part of the book. So that brings me a lot of a lot of satisfaction. Hopefully, it encourages people to ask the stories within their own families. I've done a lot of storytelling work over the years, and there's so much. It usually takes an outside event, reading something, seeing something, and saying, "Yeah, I should ask my parents, my grandparents, those stories uh, before they're lost." So, right. So. And then, and then the other the thing the other thing I do in the book is that you know I explain in the in the citations how I found most of that stuff about my family's history, not, actually not passed down but through ancestry.com, <laughs> and so, and and I mentioned that just to encourage people because there there's so much of your family history there for the taking, and even if you looked maybe five or ten years ago and you didn't find much or or hit a dead end, they've you know, the amount of material that's on sites like Ancestry.com, which you do have to pay for, but then there's FamilySearch.org, which is free and has most of the stuff that Ancestry has. Um, the amount of stuff on there has increased exponentially in the last five years. And so if you found five things on there five years ago, there are probably 25 things there now, and, and so 20 that you haven't seen. So I encourage people to, to go back and, and look again. I'd also like to shift gears just a little bit um, since we'll be having time for uh, audience questions soon. We've talked a lot about the 19th century. So Irish in the mid 19th century, Eastern European Jews and Italians around the turn of the 20th. Um, but the city changes a lot in the 20th century because of things within the city as well as changes on the federal level. Um, could you just talk a little bit about how the city has changed throughout the 20th century? Sure. So one thing that's relatively unique about New York's history is in the 1920s, uh, Congress virtually shuts down immigration, passes discriminatory quota laws that virtually shut off immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe, totally ban it from the rest of the world other than Northwestern Europe. So if you're English, if you're Irish, you can pretty much come to the United States uh, in unlimited numbers, but from pretty much any other part of the world, there are limits, um, very, very severe limits. So that New York, for the first time in its history in the mid 20th century, has relatively few immigrants. Now, New York is exceptional, however, because there's a big labor shortage in cities like New York, where 
for the jobs that immigrants had done. And Puerto Ricans begin to fill that. And so Puerto Ricans aren't literally immigrants uh, in the legal sense because they're already American citizens. So they aren't becoming, uh, they aren't coming to a new country. But Puerto Ricans start uh, coming to the to New York by the tens of thousands and start filling the jobs in the garment factories, in hotels, uh, doing domestic service. And so New York continues to be an immigrant city much more so than the rest of the United States. Now then after 1965, when those discriminatory laws are repealed, um, the whole world starts coming to America and to New York again in particular. And one of the big changes that you have in the post-1965 period is, whereas up until that point in New York's history, there had always been one or typically two big immigrant groups that would dominate each generation. The law passed in 1965 still didn't allow people to emigrate to the United States in unlimited numbers, but it gave each country in the world the same limit. And as a result, you get a much more diverse New York City after 1965. And there are lots of new immigrant groups coming to the United States then. Uh, the big groups are uh, the Chinese, who had been coming to the United States before until they were, they were banned in the late 19th century, um, immigrants from the Dominican Republic, immigrants from the English-speaking Caribbean, uh, which I talk about as the West Indies in, in the book, um, and, and, and immigrants from Asia in particular East Asia and the places um, that the United States had been involved in militarily. And so, so you have a much more diverse United States and New York in that period. Ironically, one of the few groups that isn't highly uh, represented in the late 20th century in, the United, in New York is Mexicans. Mexican immigrants uh, are especially prominent in the South and in the West and eventually in the whole country, except New York, for most of its history, has had far fewer Mexicans than the rest of the United States. Mexicans seem to see New York dominated in its Spanish-speaking population by Dominicans and Puerto Ricans and, and stayed away. But in the last 20 or 30 years, Mexicans have become one of the biggest immigrant populations in New York as well. So New York's, you know, New York has always been a multicultural place. It's now a much more diversely multicultural place than it's ever been as a result of these immigration laws. So it sounds like it's that 1960 or the changes after the 1965 law that make New York City a truly global city. Or yeah, <laughs> that, that would be the right way to think about it. Right. Definitely a truly global uh, city in that you have, you know, kind of equal numbers for a while of people from Asia, from Latin America and from Europe in terms of the immigrant population. Um, now the Asian and the Latin American are, are dominating the, the immigrant uh, population uh, even more. And I wanted to ask you about contemporary New York City. Um, you did publish this book six year, four years ago, excuse me, after working on it for a number of years. Um, but I was interested in the final chapter, you're talking about the 21st century in New York and you're framing it particularly as some of the major uh, impacts on um, the city today are the impacts of 9-11. Um, as well as new communities forming in the outer borough. So Manhattan not necessarily being the place of arrival, not necessarily being the center of community life. Um, do you still see those as the defining features in the 21st century or are there other things at play now as well? So the answer is kind of yes and no. Uh, obviously right now in this pandemic, it's hard to imagine anything else being more important than that. And not just now, but in the foreseeable future. The reason I think 9-11 is going to continue to, to kind of uh, frame how immigrants are perceived in the country though, is because you know, in, the, in the aftermath of 9-11, this, this, huge, this huge kind of immigrant, uh, kind of carceral system for immigrants in which there, is, uh, there are so many people being detained and checked and monitored in this way that you, you really didn't have before 9-11. Uh, before 9-11, you have, you know, the, the Southwest border is, is being monitored, but, um, but immigrant enforcement was, was much more mild. And, and so the reason I see 9-11 as so defining is, you know, you, you get even to a, uh, 
uh, you know, a relatively liberal or progressive uh, administration like the Obama administration. And it doesn't stop the capture and deportation of immigrants that had been going on uh, in the Republican administration before, but continues it at the same and in some cases even higher levels. And so administratively, there is this huge bureaucracy of, for finding, detaining, and deporting immigrants that you didn't have before 9-11 and that will take a real concerted effort to you know, deconstruct. Um, because, you know, you, you talk about a, a kind of uh, deep state. There is a very deep state of immigrant enforcement that didn't exist before 9-11. But the, the, then you, you mentioned the other important thing, Elizabeth, that, that's so important and, and so different than in the past in, in that immigrants now don't come to Manhattan first. That they, you know, if you're West Indian immigrant, say from Trinidad or Diana, you're going to go to Brooklyn rather than Manhattan. And if you're Dominican, your first stop, you know, it might be Washington Heights, but it's probably more likely these days to be Queens or the Bronx. And, uh, you know, for virtually every immigrant group, that's the story now. And so, you know, that, that's a story you, you often hear about with, uh, when you read about New York these days with uh, gentrification, but most immigrants have been priced out of, of pretty much all of Manhattan. And, and so as a result, immigrants now start, not only do they start in the outer boroughs, but many of them just start in the suburbs. And so there are lots of immigrants who go directly to, you know, Jersey City or Elizabeth, or will go to Westchester, or they'll go to central Long Island. And that's where they start. And bypassing the big, the gateway cities altogether. And so immigration historians and, and uh, and social scientists have always talked about gateway cities for immigrants. And now you really talk about gateway metropolitan areas because a lot of times the immigrants will skip the city centers and go right to the suburbs and start their lives there. And they have big immigrant communities uh, to join in them. Could you talk more about what you mean about gateway cities and how, how has New York City functioned as a gateway city in the past? Sure. So. Immigrants have tended to enter the United States through what social scientists call gateway cities. Um, these are places that provide immigrants with kind of a, an introduction to life in their new homeland. And so New York is the most famous uh, in American history, but you know, for the last 50 years, Los Angeles has probably been a, uh, well, not a bigger gateway city, but maybe, um, has had more immigrants pass through it because so many immigrants uh, from Latin America and Asia will start there. Um, but then some will go to, you know, Chicago, Phoenix, Atlanta now is a huge immigrant gateway portal. And, you know, the, the immigrant gateway cities, you know, used to be places like Philadelphia and Boston. Now, not so much. Now, Houston uh, would be much more important than Philadelphia and Seattle might be more, you know, would be more important than Boston. Las Vegas is a huge one now because there's just so many jobs in the service industry there. So that's the, the way in which these gateway cities serve to uh, as kind of places where immigrants can first find work, can know they have an enclave to join and help them um, learn about life in America uh, and help them eventually either stay and start a business or move on to some other part of the United States. I'm gonna ask you one more question before we turn it over to the chat. Um, I wanted to talk about race because this has been really important for all of the immigrant communities you talk about in the book, including the European communities. So how have American attitudes um, and hierarchies of race impacted some of the immigrant communities or immigrant experiences in the city? Well, um, race has you know, always been an important part of how immigrants are perceived and how immigrants perceive themselves. Um, you know, one, one of the things that's happening today is we are, you know, Americans are kind of being forced to see how central race is to the country's history, even though we've often tried to deny it. So going back, you know, all the way to early American history, one of the things that 
immigrants made very sure to do was to separate themselves from uh, darker skinned people to, to make sure Americans knew that the immigrants were, um, you know, higher on the, on the socioeconomic totem pole. So when Irish immigrants come to the United States in the, you know, the period of the famine in the 19th century, one of the things, you know, their lives are very difficult and they face huge amounts of discrimination. Um, but one of the things that gives them comfort is the knowledge that, well, we're not as bad off as the Blacks because Blacks are even more discriminated against and live even more impoverished lives. And immigrants like the Irish would go to great lengths to prove their racism as a way of trying to show white Americans that they would become good Americans too. Um, and that race mattered more than class. Because you could imagine that, you know, poor Irish Americans might want to join forces with poor African Americans to try to improve the lives of poor workers. Uh, but, but Irish Americans didn't do that. They wanted to show the rest of white America that they, uh, that they were aligning themselves with, with them. Um, race plays a, a, a big role throughout, uh, even as you move into the, the 20th century. So in the period, for example, when uh, immigrants from most of the world are banned after 1921 and 1924, one of the ways that, that immigrants would, uh, who would enter the United States illegally would try to stay would be to claim that they were Puerto Ricans. So there's, there's a great recent book about, East, uh, about South Asian immigrants in the United States in the early 20th century. And lots of cases in which when caught by the authorities and uh, threatened with deportation, these South Asians who are from modern day India or Pakistan would say, oh, no, no, I, I'm not from Asia. I'm from Puerto Rico. And the police actually couldn't tell the difference between a Puerto Rican and someone from the Indian subcontinent, which tells you how, how little familiarity they had with race. And then as you move into the more modern period, race has been a huge factor. You know, you have uh, the Crown Heights riots in the, uh, in the Dinkins administration in the late 20th century, where uh, West Indian immigrants rioted, uh, you know, and, and in theory, the riot was about a, a car accident in which uh, the child of West Indian immigrants was, was killed. But, but what that riot was, you know, really more about was just the continual racism that West Indian immigrants had to face. Um, and, and so within the immigrant, and, and really that, that all immigrants of color in, in the United States and New York have had to face, whether black or brown, um, that this has been something that immigrants talk constantly about uh, in, in New York, about how you know, life for immigrants is hard, but life for immigrants of color is even harder. And how the deck, the deck seems to be so much stacked against them because of, of so much uh, racism in the United States. So, so we might think of racism as a, uh, as really a story that only has to do with native born Americans, but it's really something that, that both native born and immigrant Americans have to deal with constantly. I'm going to turn it over to the chat now. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have a question taking us now back to the 19th century. Um, someone had a question about the first image you showed on the slide, which I can bring up in a moment. Um, early image of New York City, noticing there wasn't a bridge in sight, asking about where some of these bridges were built. But I'd also like to ask you about the history of um, immigrant workers and building the infrastructure of the city, since you do spend quite a while talking about that in the book. So I'll bring up that image so we're, um, we can talk about that as well. Sure. So that image, Go back. Yeah. There we go. I love this image. I, I had never seen this image before a couple of months ago where when it came, somebody sent me an auction catalog and there it was. Um, so this image is from the 1860s. And, and yes, there is nary a bridge in, in sight. And but you can see all those boats. Ferries constantly brought people from New Jersey to Manhattan and back and from Brooklyn to Manhattan and back. And so the first bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge, is conceived in the 1860s and built for the most part in the 1870s. Uh, 
And it's such a huge success that soon a second bridge to Brooklyn is built and then a third. And then in the, in the 20th century, you've got a bridge to Queens and then tunnels in the 20th century as well. And in the 20th century tunnels uh, to New Jersey and then the George Washington Bridge also a 20th century. George Washington Bridge is built during the New Deal in the, in the 1930s. So no bridges until the 1870s and really until the 20th century, ferries are the main way people went in and out of, of Manhattan. And then what was the, how did you add to that question, Elizabeth? I, you've talked a lot in the book, in the book about um, immigrant workers in the construction industry. So building things like tenements that reshape the city as well as um, an infrastructure. Right, so those huge building projects were really important for immigrants because they did the vast majority of the manual labor. So to build those bridges, mostly immigrant workers and especially in the most dangerous jobs. So there are dozens of people who are killed building the Brooklyn Bridge, especially in the part where they are sinking those, um, you know, the, the uh, towers that will hold the bridge up uh, uh, underground and underwater. Um, lots of immigrants are killed in, in that work. And then in the big projects, which is the early 20th century, the, like the building of the New York City subway system, almost all that underground work is done by immigrants, especially in that period, Italian immigrants. And then the big, uh, some of the big projects uh, during the New Deal were, were key in keeping immigrants employed uh, during the Great Depression. And so I, I've got a picture in, in the City of Dreams book of, of a Puerto Rican and an African American working on the Midtown Tunnel. Uh, but really all the projects, all the, the parkways that, that uh, loop around and through the city, like the, uh, you know, the Harlem River Drive and the Hudson River, uh, Henry Hudson Parkway and on the East Side Drive, all of those were built during the New Deal and mostly by immigrant workers. And it really kept immigrants from starvation uh, during the New Deal, all the kinds of uh, work projects that were done. And, and, you know, in the past, that was what Americans tended to do when there were depressions. They built great projects. And it's, it's only in very recent American history that we've stopped doing that. And to me, that's a shame. Do I have any other questions from the chat? I want to make sure we have plenty of time for audience questions. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share with us? Well, one of the things I talk about in the book that, that I think is worth touching upon is assimilation. You hear constantly in the discussions of immigration a today, a complaint that immigrants don't assimilate like they used to. And one of the things I talk about in the book is the fact that this is a myth and it's a multifaceted myth. One part of the myth is that immigrants don't assimilate like they used to. And what I talk about in the book is that they really do. But the second part of the myth is that immigrants in the past assimilated a lot. And this is something that really isn't true. Uh, and, and I talk in the book and I, and I show this through the centuries that adult immigrants really don't assimilate very much. Adults who come to America tend to spend their lives in enclaves with other immigrants. They tend to continue speaking their native language for most of their lives. They learn very little English if they don't come to America with much of it. Certainly they don't learn enough English to make native born Americans very happy and will speak it with a thick accent that they will you know, go to their graves eating the same food they ate in their homeland, playing the same game, singing the same songs, and that, that adult immigrants just don't assimilate that much. And, and often we think, well, my grandfather assimilated and, or no. great grandfather, <laughs> and they might've seemed like they assimilated to us, but to people not from our ethnic group, they weren't very assimilated at all. And that's the thing that we have trouble remembering. And so, so immigrants tend, adult immigrants tend not to assimilate. The group that does assimilate are children. Those who come to America as children, especially going to public school, but even if they go to private school, children want very much to fit in. They assimilate very quickly. 
And so it tends to be the children who become quote unquote assimilated in natives eyes. I would like to talk about this idea of assimilation um, because that's actually not a term I'm usually comfortable using. Um, I know there's a lot of debate, is it in assimilation integration? But I think, I think there's a way I think there's a way that we can imagine that people can, or people in the past, you know, stopped, became like the rest of the country, this idea you adopted a white Anglo-Saxon culture. Um, and we know that's not true, even if someone does learn to speak English fluently, does have certain occupations that people change the city as well. The city changes and there's no, there is no leaving a certain culture behind, but rather a num number of people who come to the city and the city changes too. But that's not a term, I don't know if we're, we're looking at it the different way. I'm just curious, why do you use this term assimilation throughout the book? I use the term because it is so much part of the debate about immigration. President Trump uses it all the time. Uh, congressmen use it all the time. It's, it's so much a part of the debate about immigration. When you look at the things that, um, you know, when people poll, Americans and ask them um, why they want immigration limited or restricted. Um, you know, they'll say immigrants take our jobs, immigrants don't assimilate like they used to. Those are the two main things that people say. And so that's why I think even if, uh, even if like you, I, I might agree that talking about assimilation raises this expectation that's, that's unfair um, it's so much part of the way we think about immigrants that it's, it's important to talk about it, even if to say it's something that has never happened, right? So sometimes you have to talk about those things to help people understand them. But to be clear in the book you show, it did in fact never happen. Um, and there is a question in the chat asking if immigrants have been, were encouraged to learn English. I'm assuming that means in previous historical eras. So I know you talk a lot about that in the 19th century, um, early 20th century as well. So the answer is encouraging immigrants to learn English is really a 20th century thing. So until the 20th century, there was just this expectation, well, immigrants will eventually learn English if they want to and they need to, but they weren't pushed to do so. So, you know, you have where the Tenement Museum sits now was a very predominantly German neighborhood. And so much so that you could, you know, walk blocks and not see a sign in English and not hear English spoken. But you never see in the New York press much talk about how, you know, the idea that it's terrible that those people aren't speaking English. It was seen as quaint rather than something to be feared. It's really with World War I that you, for the first time, have a, a kind of national push to, to have immigrants learn English. Oh, and the, the other thing to mention, which Americans especially don't realize, is that you, know, you didn't have to know a word of English to become an American citizen until very recently in American history. Uh, for most American history, you could become an, uh, a citizen and not know a single word of English. So it's only with World War I where Americans felt kind of unsafe that there were so many different ethnic groups representing each side in World War I in the United States that they felt like pushing immigrants to learn English would be a, an important way in de-hyphenating the immigrants and making them all more fully American and to not look at themselves as not have them root for one side or the other uh, in World War I, except the American side, and that learning English would be a way to unite immigrants. And so, so pushing immigrants to learn English is a, is a recent thing. Even then, though, you didn't have to know English to become a citizen. That's, that's a recent thing. So today's immigrants are much more, today's immigrants know much more about American history, actually, than most Americans, because to pass the naturalization uh, test, you have to know more civics and know more American history than most Americans learn. And I have one more question for the chat before we wrap up, um, talking about past contemporary and, and historical immigrant experiences. Someone was asking us if historical immigrant enclaves and the services they provide um, 
are they different from what's going on in contemporary enclaves or communities that have large numbers of immigrants? Any time period, your choice. Yeah. Um, it's complicated would be the, the precise answer. I mean, the answer is kind of yes and no. So, so immigrant enclaves, you know, one of the biggest features of, of immigrant enclaves that we tend to forget about is that many immigrants throughout American history have made their livelihoods serving newer immigrants. So, you know, here I am in Schneider's saloon and, uh, you know, the saloon would be a place where immigrants would not go not just to get a drink, but, you know, the saloon keeper would be somebody who is well versed in city politics, in uh, the law, would have friends on the police force, would have friends in city hall so that if, you know, in your neighborhood, if you, uh, you know, if you needed a job, you lost your job, you would go to the saloon keeper and they might be able to get you a job, a city job. Or if, you, um, you know, someone in your family, your breadwinner was sick, they would help you uh, get some food or some fuel to get you by until uh, your family member was able to work again. And so, so one common thing has been that immigrants have always done most of their selling to other immigrants. So immigrants are very entrepreneurial, always more so than natives, but most of their entrepreneurship is selling to, to other immigrants. And so so that's one way in which it, it's continued to be the same. Immigrants also have tended to, to go, if you're male, into things like construction. And that's been the case from the 1700s all the way to today. Women have tended to, female immigrants have tended to go into things like domestic service, cleaning other people's homes, caring for their children. That's been the case for hundreds of years. So the answer is for the most part, yes, immigrants, over the centuries have tended to do the same kinds of work, both in their enclaves and outside. And it sounds like you're also saying that community support has also been crucial across the four centuries that you're talking about in the book. Absolutely, that, that immigrants uh, tend to help other immigrants. They help, they patronize their businesses, they give them leads, uh, they help them kind of make their way in the, in the bigger city as well when it's time. Well, we are out of time and I hate to, to stop you right there. I know we could probably talk for another hour, um, but we're very grateful you joined us tonight. And just so everyone watching knows, um, the book is City of Dreams, which is available from the Tenement Museum's bookstore. We will ship even though we're currently closed. So we'll put that link for you in the chat. Um, we really appreciate your time tonight. This has been a great conversation. We hope to have you back again soon. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And we encourage you, if you enjoyed tonight's event, um, please sign up for our, our newsletter list. We're having a number of virtual events coming up. We'd love for you to join us for those. Um, and if you feel so moved, we appreciate um, your donations, and your financial support while we're closed. We're looking forward to opening when it's safe uh, enough to do so. But in the meantime, we're happy to provide you with virtual content from home. So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Tyler.